Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to provide, present to you, uh, in particular, your indulgence in allowing me to do this online as I wasn't able to uh, come to Helsinki. Um, I'm grateful for the assistance Wider uh, has given me uh, over several years, uh, and in particular, the, the, the work I did with one of the other panelists, Per Pinstrup Anderson, on food policy as well as the work that Wider supported looking at uh, foreign assistance to agriculture, which is why uh, I was asked to give this particular presentation. Um, I want to begin with some background. Uh, come on, what am I going to do? Get this one. Okay, I want to begin with some background on what's happened uh, to foreign assistance to agriculture over time, because there's a, a marked, uh, important trend uh, that that reversed somewhat uh, around 2008 at the time of the commodity price spikes and what we sometimes call uh, the food crisis then and again in 2011. But there's been over time a noticeable decline in foreign assistance given to agriculture. The peak uh, was at 20% of total overseas development assistance in 1983 uh, and it fell to a minimum of 3.7% in 2006. This is assistance to agriculture. And in addition, there's another category uh, measured in ODA called developmental food aid or food security assistance. And that was another 7.5% of uh, ODA in 1984. So in the mid 80s, uh, assistance to agriculture and food security was over a quarter of development assistance that fell to 1% in 2006, the developmental food aid part of it, making overall assistance under 5% at that time. There are, there are a number of measurement issues uh, associated with this data, including aggregation of uh, ag forestry and fisheries data prior to 1995 and how you count uh, humanitarian food aid of which much of developmental food aid uh, is considered. And there's an excellent discussion of this by Neural Islam from IFPRI in 2011. If you want to know what all the different categories are, of this are about and some of the problems in interpreting the data, I strongly recommend his paper. Uh, this is the data from the OECD showing the trends over time, showing the spike in developmental food aid uh, around the late 1960s and then uh, the decline of that over time to a plateau that uh, was, as I said, about 3% in 2006. Uh, we see the blue line in this graph is agriculture and forestry and fisheries aid, um, which peaked uh, around 1983 and declined rapidly until uh, about 2003. It leveled off then, and then we see some increase uh, after about 2000. Uh, and six. Uh, why did this happen? What was the decline in aid to agriculture the result of? Um, I think it's fair to say that many products either failed or experienced only limited uh, success over uh, much of this uh, history. Resources as a result went to more successful population health and education interventions. Uh, some believe this is because agriculture involves many small, highly competitive private entities, and it's quite difficult to intervene to improve the lot of those entities and to reach all of the actors uh, that might be uh, involved. Uh, it's a lot easier to build a school or to build a health center in a village than to reach lots of farmers living in, in uh, uh, dispersed areas. Um, another issue uh, is the consequence of structural transformation, an important issue that, that another one of the panelists will talk about uh, and that will be important as I look at uh, what we might consider in the future. Uh, some economic models have de-emphasized agriculture since the pioneering work of Lewis uh, uh, in the 60s. And many economists still believe that uh, the good service industries uh, and as a result, uh, foreign aid to agriculture is not a priority. 
Uh, more, also, the importance of agriculture in transitioning economies uh, has declined. This has led to people to choose not to support agriculture as much as other activities. Uh, subsidies, taxes, and the parastatals, the public organizations involved in markets have distorted those markets. Uh, and very importantly, there are missing markets, particularly things like credit and input markets for agriculture and their governance and policy uh, failures. Uh, the World Bank has strongly emphasized uh, these latter two factors, the missing markets and the governance and policy failures as uh, one of the principal reasons for the decline uh, in foreign assistance to agriculture. Uh, there was somewhat of a change following the spike in commodity prices in 2007, eight, and again uh, in 2011. Uh, it brought huge promises of more aid and some actual increases. As I said, the low was 3.7% in 2006. In 2009, this jumped to 5.3% of ODA. Foreign assistance was 5.5% again in 2012. And the latest date is 2016, where it slipped to about 4.3%. Promises for this aid uh, were large uh, at the time. Uh, there were numerous international meetings, including the World Food Summit uh, in 2008 and, and the Lakia G8 uh, Summit uh, in 2009. Uh, and at the Lakia Summit, the G8 countries promised an additional $22 billion uh, and foreign assistance. As always, these promises were a bit vague. If you looked at the details, this wasn't to occur in one year. Uh, at the time, total foreign assistance to ag was about $4 billion. Uh, and in 2007, it jumped to $6 billion. Food security assistance at the time is, was about $1.4 uh, billion. Uh, the promises were committed over several years. They uh, did not prove to be additional. This is a, a list, if you want to look later, at a number of the kinds of initiatives that were taken and the amounts of money uh, that were. Uh, there was what, some increase in food uh, assistance and in agricultural development assistance following this crisis. Uh, this looks at the data over time of the various categories. Agriculture is the blue line. On this, we see the decline to 2006, uh, the ramp up and leveling off at a somewhat higher uh, level after 2006. We see the decline in food uh, aid and food security assistance over time with a brief jump in 2008 and then a decline. And then a new category that emerged, which is labeled basic nutrition, which is one of the new areas that has become important. We also see the trends in uh, health education and population, and, and population notably has been something that also has increased post-2007. Uh, as foreign assistance to agriculture declined and then increased, the design of interventions has changed. As people have looked at that, they've seen num numerous changes um, since, say, the 1970s, uh, when agriculture was trying to become important and the ways that we went about uh, trying to improve agriculture changed a lot. <clears throat> it used to be the case that substantial resources were given to input and credit subsidies and fewer resources have gone to that area. There's less support for land and water augmentation, things like building dams, uh, in the mid 1970s to the 1980s, integrated rural development uh, projects uh, were pursued. These were believed to be complex and hard uh, to implement uh, and so were not pursued. Uh, and recently governance policies and institutions uh, have been emphasized and are now part of public goods. Agricultural research is something that us ag economists at least have always thought uh, was important and, and there's better recognition of that. And there also exists a number of alternative development programs uh, such as uh, the use of cocoa instead of drugs uh, as a way for rural populations to make a living. Okay, this graph comes from the OECD database and shows 
some of the different categories. As Islam points out, the categorization is not perfect to show what's going on. Uh, the brown line at the top is a category called development and policy, and you see that it is somewhat erratic over time, but much larger than the other categories, and in particular in 2016, it's, it's taking up nearly 60% of uh, the ODA that um, is going to agriculture. The green line of research, which peaks around 2008 uh, and always has been a bit erratic and has come down uh, over time. The orange line shows inputs, and we see since the mid-1990s that's been coming down. The 2008 crisis brought a, speak, a peak in inputs as lots of countries wanted uh, fertilizer subsidies uh, as a strategy, and, and then it settled back down to the level at or somewhat below uh, where it was before. Um, the World Bank had anticipated this change in uh, the nature of foreign assistance to agriculture and in its 2008 De World Development Report it devoted that to agriculture and I thought what was interesting is this was prior to uh, the 07-08 crisis uh, and they advocated increased investment in agriculture ahead of those crises. It also provided a framework for subsequent interventions based on past experience. This is where the notion that probably drives the current design of um, a foreign assistance to agriculture uh, that emerged. And that was that they said that, that much of the failure was due to past governance and policy failures. And if uh, ag foreign assistance was to work we needed a much improved uh, policy environment. Um, the, the, the emphasized uh, market access and value chains, that the, the nature of the markets was critical, that smallholder competitiveness was critical, uh, that employment needed to be emphasized in both non-farm and farm activities, and these had to lead to improved uh, livelihood for subsistence farmers. This is uh, a diagram taken from that report showing uh, the various ways in which they thought um, that agriculture could matter. Okay, uh, there, there are a number of, of new, not entirely new, uh, but, but more heavily emphasized initiatives and concepts that I wanted to point out. Uh, as always, uh, when you look at foreign assistance uh, and you look at government intervention, uh, emphasis pla is placed on uh, public goods and in, in the case since it's both global and national public goods and this is not just technology and infrastructure but I think the emphasis on institutions as a public good uh, is one of the important features of uh, foreign assistance initiatives afterwards. Policy reg regulation and governance are all seen uh, as public uh, goods. Uh, Value chains have been emphasized. Uh, we look at inputs, markets, uh, and institutions, and not just uh, what's going on on the farm. Uh, and these have tended to um, emphasize exports and higher value added goods. As I noted earlier, nutrition interventions have become important. And, and there are at least two ways to look at these. A lot of nutrition interventions target vulnerable groups, particularly uh, mothers and, and uh, young children, and so maternal and child health interventions are important, but also there's a dimension of nutrition-sensitive agriculture where, where people with knowledge about nutrition try and inform uh, interventions. Scaling up uh, has become an issue. It, it's become apparent that there's technologies available to improve agriculture, and we know how to, to descend on a village and improve the lot of smallholder farmers in that village, but getting uh, interventions to matter to large populations is difficult. And I think the other concept uh, that's important is public-private uh, partnerships, uh, leading to another topic I was asked to address in this, which is the role of foreign investment in all of this. And, and let me just talk about that in this case. In, in many developing countries, foreign aid has been a huge part of a country's agricultural development budget, the amount of money that government spends and, and the amount 
it's invested uh, in agricultural development, at least uh, for public goods. There are numerous cases in Africa where foreign aid can be uh, more than 80% of uh, the agricultural budget uh, in a country. The scare in 2007-8 uh, led to a discussion about whether or not uh, agriculture can feed the addition more than 9 billion people expected in uh, 2050 uh, and noted this will require substantially increased resources uh, to meet that production. To put this in perspective, the FAO did an estimate uh, and they said that there would be need to be an additional $83 billion invested in agriculture uh, in developing countries based on a current $142 billion uh, invested. Uh, and uh, right now, foreign aid and FDI are each about $10 billion. Uh, much of that investment's private uh, domestic investment. Uh, and one of the points was you'd never get enough resources from foreign aid uh, to meet the investment needs that are required. Uh, and the hope was that the, the portion coming from the private sector, in particular from uh, FDI, could be increased substantially. This has led to much emphasis on public-private partnerships and on leveraging uh, private investment. Uh, it, it's difficult to find ways to do this for smallholders. The issue I raised earlier as to why agriculture has been a problem. So at least my assessment is that there's lots of talk about this and lots of discussions of the issues involved in trying to implement in public-private partnerships, but they've proven somewhat difficult to implement over time. That said, multinationals have been in a long history of being involved in agriculture, more so in export industries uh, than in other industries. And much of my experiences in Africa working on cocoa and to an extent Latin America as well. Uh, and there's a long history of multinationals involved in that area. But one of the things that's striking is the limited penetration inside borders of those countries. They, they set up shop in the ports uh, and sometimes intervene in markets, but have limited involvement um, on the farm and in, in much of the value chain. Um, I think I'm going to skip that over time. <clears throat> I was asked to comment on, on wider and how it affects this. Wider's uh, themes for successful agricultural development are transformation, that, that uh, inclusion and sustainability, and these are both keys to successful agricultural development. <clears throat> One of the issues uh, for those of us in agriculture uh, dates back to the Lewis controversy. Uh, and people now believe that agriculture, particularly in Africa, should be playing a leading role uh, in economic growth. And this is an area that I think needs more work and attention in the future. And hopefully one of the other panelists um, will, will discuss more that issue. Um, inclusion, agriculture, growth and poverty uh, reduction. The, the notion is that while agriculture may not lead to the most rapid economic growth, growth uh, that involves agriculture is led by agriculture tends to lead to uh, greater poverty reduction. Uh, and agriculture also uh, involves safety nets. And then sustainability, agriculture is an important component of adaptation to climate change. Okay. Um, I think in the interest of time, there are a number of wider projects that address these. As I've noted earlier, a big component of aid to agriculture now is in the form of policy. Um, and, and a major project directed by Per Pinstrup Anderson looked at a number of case studies uh, to ask how did they react to this uh, food crisis in 2007 and 08, and what policies uh, were put in place. Uh, this is a, a good uh, work to understand what happened and the difference in priorities of um, donors uh, versus uh, governments in recipient countries. Uh, the donors were interested in long-term ag development and safety nets and uh, 
the uh, governments who are interested in boosting uh, production in the short term through input subsidies and the like and broad um, consumer protection. <clears throat> There's also been a considerable amount of work at wider looking at aid effectiveness. Uh, and this contributed to one of the pieces I was able to work on, uh, looking at how foreign assistance played a role in the crisis and, and how uh, it might have evolved. Afterwards, this is done under the Recon Research and Communication to Foreign Aid Project. And as you can see on this slide, there were a number of other activities in there as well. Um, it has also been a project uh, by Arndt, McKay, and Tarp under the Reconciling Agricult Africa's Growth, Poverty, and Inequality uh, Trends. And they looked at 16 case uh, studies and, and asked how policy reform and institution building uh, was working in the, those cases. And I think this is an example of something uh, that needs to be followed up on uh, and done more often because this is one of the keys uh, to improving agricultural assistance. Uh, and then there's a project under development and uh, climate change by our farmers, say, sort of rep, uh, and Thurlow, uh, which is another area that wider has been working. Uh, in addition, in the project on new directions and development policy, Luke Credis Jansen uh, and colleagues have looked at a number of roles. He, he, he explores a concept that's interesting that says agriculture is good for raising dollar a day uh, or reducing dollar a day poverty, but it becomes a little less effective when the goal is $2 uh, a day poverty. It can raise poverty levels at the various lowest levels, but then there are limits to how far that goes. And this is related to this structural transformation issue uh, we needed to worry about. Uh, and then there's, there's work on the political economy of social protection systems. Much of the work at wider has been done in Latin America, and the two key cases are probably Brazil and Ethiopia, uh, which are contrasts in, this, in a debate that exists between whether or not cash transfers uh, can replace food aid as a social safety net. Um, I want to make just a few observations uh, about effective of uh, food aid, uh, and then think about what that means for a research agenda uh, moving forward. Uh, first of all, local small-scale interventions are well understood and can be quite successful. I think of the Millennium villages in the uh, Green Revolution in Africa of the Foreign Foundation. Uh, we've learned from these and from other work that off-the-shelf technologies exist now. Okay? We don't necessarily need new technology to improve the lot of small farmers in Africa, uh, but we need to make better use of the technology that exists. When these interventions come to a village, they bring institutions and, mar and markets along uh, with technology. Uh, and while you can easily intervene at village level, scaling that up to matter at a national level is quite challenging. In terms of value chains, uh, they're important because they emphasize this, not just <clears throat> on farm initiatives, uh, but market development. Uh, they also emphasize higher value and exported products and it's some work I've done. Uh, sometimes the targets are, are probably not as realistic as they might be. And this leads to the fact that while there've been some great successes, think flowers uh, out of Kenya or green beans out of Senegal, uh, but many of the value chain efforts have uh, not been at all cost effective. Uh, the fertilizer subsidies I mentioned, uh, this has been less important to donors and it remains something that governments uh, think are important and it was part of, it's been part of their agenda over the last uh, decade. Uh, I want to mention the, the challenge of structural transformation. Uh, can we lead uh, economic growth with uh, interventions and, and investments uh, in agriculture? Uh, and how will employment evolve uh, in the meantime? I think it's right that ag growth may benefit the extreme poor, but as a wider study 
has emphasized it's less effective for relieving uh, $2 poverty a day. When those of us who study ag policy look at its evolution over time, we attribute many of the institutions that arise in developed country agriculture to the problems of the structural transformation and the release of labor from agriculture over time. Can that be avoided or not? A related issue is what's now referred to as the greening of poverty. We've known for a long time that if you go to an area and you increase production dramatically, prices can collapse and intervention in agriculture mostly benefit uh, consumers. Um, as I mentioned in public private partnerships, there's more talk than action. Uh, and, and the studies that I uh, reviewed provided little assessment of the scope and success of activities. Yeah. Okay, so, so let me just, just conclude by saying that, that one of the initiatives has been to try and improve governance. And uh, this has been going on uh, since the Maputo Declaration in 2003, where governments in Africa committed to spend 10% uh, of their resources on agriculture, uh, and only 10 of 47 CADAP members do that. This was uh, repeated in Malibu, and that still hasn't happened. Okay, so I think going forward, I would emphasize uh, two. <clears throat> agendas where wider can play an important role. One is this question of structural transformation. Is agricultural led growth uh, realistic? How do you deal with employment and poverty along the way? And can you leapfrog uh, the ag policy history that structural transformation has led to? And the other issue is the heavy emphasis on policy governments and institutions. Are reforms working? Can we improve uh, institutions to foreign aid or decisions taken by some donors to only give aid to uh, countries that are well governed, uh, an appropriate role, and, and what role does uh, policy play in climate change? I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you.